Welcome back to another episode of In Swine Versation. Swine industry age gaps with Taylor Rock, production supervisor at Hymerell Farms. Welcome, Taylor. My pleasure. You know, you got a busy month ahead, so I appreciate your time. Now, let's get right to the one major concern that you have in our industry. Uh, you're worried about the age gap from older and younger, where many people are retiring before properly teaching the youth. Absolutely. I know that I've worked with a lot of people and the older generation who really was the foundation for the industry is starting to get to the time where they want to retire, though I don't think a lot of those people are ever going to actually fully retire. They'll cut back on their time, but there's not enough new people coming into the industry that want to be a part of the bigger picture um, fast enough for these people to teach them what they know so we can continue to grow the industry. So, so has this been a problem for a while, Taylor? I think it's been a accumulating problem for a long time. I think the industry's had so many issues with prolapsing and, you know, litter size and feed conversion, working to make everything else perfect. Uh, we forgot about who did that and why they got there. A lot of people put a lot of hard work and a lot of hours in to get to where we are now. And it's, I think, undervalued uh, how much, you know, responsibility that we're about ready to take on the, the rest of us that are just getting into the industry. Is there a root of the problem or is it just one of those things that over time, this is where we're at? I think over time, I, this is just where we're at. Um, I think it happens in a lot of other industries as well, um, especially with industries that are quickly advancing. Um, people grow fast in the industry and they, you know, climb the ladder very quickly and not everybody's following the ladder up right behind them. Is there a solution? I think the solution is restructuring how we view the industry and see the industry and, you know, make it more team oriented to show that each part of a system or a company has value and it really adds into the bigger picture. You know, I think a lot of these people that are leaving in the higher up positions, if you can find somebody that can replace 70% of the knowledge and the value that they have, and then you can have somebody else come in and do the 30%. Yeah, you're spreading that out, but I think that's more of a realistic um, view of where we're headed. So in a couple of weeks, in September, you're speaking at the Four Star Vet Conference about international employees. Is there a sneak peek that you have for us? Yeah, absolutely. So that's been kind of one of my projects here when I started working with Heim Rolls, uh, was kind of developing their TN program and what I'm going to do is kind of introduce to people that it's not as scary and as difficult working with the government as you might think on these things. And we have a lot of support and it, there's a lot of possibility we have um, as an industry as a whole to gain a lot of interest for sustainable staffing. So you see the, the entire picture of a pool of talent out there and sometimes you got to work with the government and do things to get to that pool of talent. And it's not as overwhelming as people might think. Absolutely. And I think the quality you can get, it's worth the time taking that extra step um, to have people. And you're also helping people create better lives for themselves. And I think really that's the big picture of the industry is, you know, creating a better future. So let's talk about yourself, Taylor, your story journey and how you got involved in the pig industry. Absolutely. So I didn't have much experience outside of swine for other than a few years, years in 4-H. I grew up on a cattle ranch. I went to Kansas State and my first experience with swine was actually a 24-hour internship. And, you know, I owe a lot to Art Sauter and LSI for that experience because that really opened the doors to what I could do in the industry and led me into my first job with AMVC and their leadership development program. And um, worked my way up through there and managed a farm in Colorado. And um, a little bit after doing that at that farm, that's when I uh, made the jump to come out here to Ohio right at the beginning of COVID. So what did you most learn at AMVC? I really learned how you can operate a farm a million different ways. There's a lot of right ways to do things. And I think gathering all that information and be able to see, you know, different farms function in different settings uh, it really opens up the possibilities for you know somebody that's brand new coming into the, into the industry with no kind of prior experience or view of how things should be operated so can you tell us a little bit about high morale what it's like to work in ohio and the culture 
Absolutely. This is the first time I had ever been to Ohio was the, the week that I had drove out here. So it was a, quite a big change moving from Colorado. Heimel is a really good company to work for. They're a great family. Uh, we produce a lot of gilts uh, through PIC um, and sell gilts for them. Uh, it's a good company culture. It's been a difficult time during COVID because everybody was so divided. I know there was a period of time, you know, where, you know, we physically couldn't get together and meet. So, you know, redeveloping the company culture to be more of this 21st century where, where the industry and everything is heading has been, you know, exciting to help be a part and help develop that for them. So when you came in, like, how did you help shift the culture? Uh, at first, it was helping the Heimrolls put their vision kind of on the paper, you know, working with a lot of international employees and people that are new to the industry. I feel like they find a lot of comfort in being able to have something that they can look at um, as reference material and doing a lot of hands on hand training with the employees to help get that vision through, um, you know, being the boots on the ground at the very beginning was how I was able to you know, help shift that company culture into being you know, more what it is today. So you mentioned you were hired when COVID started, and since then you've achieved 93% farrowing rates over the last three years. What did you do to achieve this, Taylor? Absolutely. So um, it wasn't 93% consistently over the last three years. 93% was our top farrowing rate. Um, I had those, those farms were kind of more consistently around 90 and 91% uh, farrowing rates over a quarter span. But it was really, you know, stepping back and identifying the valuable people on our teams. There's people that are definitely very far more talented than I'll ever be in certain things and making them the leaders in those departments. Um, one of my farms that does really well actually just became our training farm where all of our new empo employees get that experience. So it's, it's kind of that welcoming, hey, it's safe. You're going to be here for two weeks. You're going to get the rundown of how things are operated. So it's really creating that foundation for people um, leads to the consistency and the consistency leads to the numbers. So when you look at people, you try to put them in a position to succeed at the highest level, which then attributes success back to the team. Absolutely. Everybody wants to feel like they're a part of something and they, you know, they matter and they have value. And, you know, if you're paying attention to your teams, they'll show you and they'll tell you what they're interested in. You know, not everybody's going to come up to you and say, hey, I want to be doing this, but they'll point themselves in that direction. And it's up to leaders. Um, it's their responsibility to find that and show them the team that they have that value and amplify it. What about new goals moving forward? New goals moving forward is continuing with consistent staffing and keeping those numbers um, steady where they're at. Uh, there's always room to improve and it's just trying to change half a percent here and there at a time is what we're working with right now. It's kind of slow and steady progress. Yeah, and I think that's probably the most difficult thing to do. It's easy to turn a farm around that's been struggling for a long time and get it up to have really good numbers. But getting to hold those good numbers is the most difficult thing you can do. Um, one of the farms I had, they had the exact breed target for the entire year in a row, and I was ecstatic about it. You know, in that you can also say that there's some opportunity missed, but to have that kind of consistency and direction, I think, you know, where we need to be directing ourselves. So you're still fairly young in your career, but you've seen it all from fires, hailstones, herd closures, herd breaks, batch farm conversion, PERS rollover. Did I miss anything, Taylor? That's been the big scope of things I, I have done. Um, the, the wild things, out of the ordinary things. We're only being in the industry coming up on just seven years now. I sure have seen a lot. And all those experiences really led me to be able to see outside of the box. You know, I've had a very good direction of how things should be operated, you know, based off of the book. But, you know, in those weird situations, that's where I think you're really able to learn good flow and how things actually operate by having to adjust stuff out of the norm and be able to get it back to the norm after you fix your problems. Is there any stories you can share about how it shaped you and how you are today? Absolutely. So the one thing, uh, ventilation is one of the biggest things in the farm uh, next to biosecurity. And 
the farm I had that had a fire, one of the big, biggest issues I had is people would always leave doors open, nonstop would leave doors open, leave doors open. And I hit on that for months and months and months at a time. And finally, some things happened and the fire came around and they had finally started closing those doors. And, you know, that really stuck into me that if you're consistent with the things that are value and they matter to you, it'll eventually come around. I think people are, are hard to change their ways, but if you give it six to eight weeks of consistent um, pressure on whatever you're, you're trying to get, you'll have results at the end of it. So one of the hot topics that you want to address is the family farm and working in the working environment. Can you explain this in detail? Absolutely. I think it's the greatest honor to be a family farm and it's great to work for a family farm and, you know, changing the dynamic with the farms I work directly with is, you know, I let them know that the, the family we work for gives us the opportunity to create this team. And I remind people that the team is what allows us to be successful in the swine industry and shifting people's focus onto what actually a team means. Everybody has a family, they have different family structures and that's a hard thing for some people to make a connection with, but there are a lot less different varieties of teams to where people can make a connection with and you can have some sort of common ground that you're moving forward on. And that's kind of been my goal is structuring things to be, you know, just like a football team. They have everything that you need. You have your head coach that's running the show. You have your assistant coach that is trusted by your head coach to push their vision and their image forward. On top of that, they have the trainers and the nutritionists. So all these little details, you know, I'm trying to focus our operation to focus on those employees as each part of the puzzle. So you feel like the term family farm is used like it means it's better? I, I think it is used like it like it's a better thing and it is better but i don't think people appreciate the value of what that actually means it's a big deal especially in you know today's day there's a lot less family farms and i don't think people value what that actually is and the opportunities that large family farms have given people like me to create teams within so football team are you a football fan i am i am so the quick rundown college or pro team favorite team uh, i'm a Kansas State fan and a Broncos fan because I'm from Colorado. So okay, was it uh, John Elway? Was that before your time? No, John Elway. Yep. So, what's an example of a team member that has excelled, or your process which has led to success? Yes, I have a great example. So I had an employee that. Um, we started out at similar times. Uh, she came in as just a swine technician, um, had a college degree, didn't have any ex much experience with swine before, especially at this scale, didn't go to school for swine or anything at all. And um, she just had the passion and the drive and she wanted to be able to be a part of that something bigger. And I noticed that early on and I placed her with different people and in different locations to so she was able to gain some experience in different settings and more knowledge and, you know, putting her with the best of the best people was able to make her very good. And she was able to work her way up from swine technician um, during this whole COVID spell all the way up to a farm manager. And she's one of the people that really helped me, uh, you know, raise one of the farms farrowing rates like 10%. So just showing that consistent and consistency and passion in somebody um, it's able to make things very smooth and consistent. That's a great example. Do you think you're more of a vocal leader or kind of lead by example? Uh, I lead by example. I would never ask my employees to do anything I wasn't willing to do. And, you know, I'm probably one of the few you'll catch me in the barn, sometimes castrating or power washing. If, if that's what the team needs to feel that they're supported, I'm willing to go out of the way and do those things. So what should we think of when we hear of the word ag tech, specifically in the swine industry? I think we should think of here it's coming. Um, it's on its way. Uh, the difficulty with that is the industry has a lot of older facilities and this new tech is shiny and fancy and uh, the implementation process is going to be, I think, our biggest barrier for ag tech when it comes into the industry. Um, and especially as we develop things, we don't necessarily know exactly how we want it, but we know we want something. So working our way through that process so what you've seen with ag tech currently, is there an example how it's benefited you? 
Yeah, so our farms used to do all of our data and paperwork. We'd on paper and send it to the office and somebody would enter it in the computer. Um, and one of the things I was able to instill in my employees is uh, take value in the work you do. Um, they enter their data on a tablet now or a scanner in, in the farms. And so they're able to take value in the work that they did because they know that they're responsible for how the numbers look for everybody that's looking at the farm. Has there been an example where ag tech has hurt? I'm, I'm sure there are examples. I mean, systems just not operating at what, what their expected um, efficiency rate was, you know, like electronic feeding systems. People have a lot of issues with those, but, you know, they're a great thing. It's just working out the kinks. And that's a part of the process. I think we've worked out the kinks just in different ways for many, many years. It's always kind of an evolving process there. And until the industry stops evolving, I'm going to be a part of it because I think that's what makes it exciting. Yeah, learn, learning and new challenges. Now, mm -hmm. what about something we can do to sustain, to make the pork industry greater by 10% over the next 10 years? What, what can we do? Now, I question, how are we making it greater? I think that the motive is more important than, you know, the process. Um, are we making it greater by production? Are we making it greater by pig quality, by size? I think there's a variety of ways to answer that. So I'll let you pick, but when I think greater, I think overall level demand for pork, where pork is selling at a higher level and people are increasing consumption of pork. I think the shift to focusing on uh, pork quality um, and the quality of animals, it's going to kind of create a keeping up with the Joneses aspect where, you know, your neighbor down the road has these really good pigs that are producing this. And um, you're like, OK, I got to start doing something different and creating that competition. To, that's healthy because we both want to be doing well because we need each other um, in the industry. And, you know, by the time, you know, you actually get around to making genetic progress at these farms, those barns are about time to be paid off. And it's like, let's add on more to them and expand the industry that way. It's a slow process, but I think that focusing on quality now in the long run is what's going to continue to maintain that sustainability. Well, it was a great conversation, Taylor. Thanks for joining us today. I appreciate it. Thank you.